most beloved Bhagwan, respected senior faculty, dear colleagues, and my dear students. Start my talk giving my obeisance to Lord Ganesha and my beloved Bhagwan. As I said, the historical perspective of mitral valve surgery, if you see the timeline, it's 1896 to today. Uh, when we talk on historical perspectives, uh, it is striking to see that the first attempts in the 19th century over the years only slowly became an established method of treatment. Now here are some of the quotes of the famous people of the year. You find the Aristotle making a claim that the heart alone of all the viscera cannot withstand surgery. This is expected because when the main source of strength they believe is destroyed. No strength can be brought to the organs which depend upon it. So said the famous uh, gastrointestinal surgeon that anybody who decided or attempted to suture a wound in the heart was sure to lose forever the consideration and esteem of his colleagues. And we all know <coughs> that in the year 1896, uh, in uh, Frankfurt, there was a uh, doctor, uh, cardiac surgeon Ludwig Grain. He succeeded in suturing a stab wound in a man's heart and by accomplishing, accomplishing this, he not only proved that uh, the heart which was venerated as the center of life and the site of the soul, he made it accessible to the surgeon. I think he made accessible the physical heart and he opened the way to what is today called the era of cardiovascular surgery. Now, I would like to restrict myself to just uh, mitral valve surgery. So I would like to summarize the entire evolution of thought and the technique of mitral valve surgery as it progressed down the century. The first successful surgical treatment of mitral stenosis, we are celebrating, we just recently celebrated the 90th anniversary of Elliot Cutler's mitral commissurotomy. It was Elliot Carr Cutler and his cardiology colleague even in those eras, the cardiologists and cardiac surgeons could not be separated. So they, in uh, Ilya Cattrall with uh, Samuel Levine, his cardiology colleague, they performed a closed transventricular mitral commissurotomy with a tenotomy knife in a 12-year-old girl who was dying of mitral stenosis at the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital. And the patient, can you believe it, survived for the four years post-operatively and she ended up dying of pneumonia. Subsequently, this was the first successful surgery. Subsequently, when he performed seven more operations, he did not meet with success. The first three he did with the tenotomy knife, as you see. Uh, can I have the big pointer? And then the subsequent uh, uh, four operations were performed with what is a device designed by him called a cardiovalvular tom. He would excise a portion of the mitral valve leaflet creating what is what he called was a controlled mitral regurgitation. Unfortunately, this concept did not promote long-term success and a moratorium of these operations was called in 1929. Nevertheless, this pioneering, pioneering effort in 1923 was the first successful operation to treat valvular heart disease by a surgical technique. Then came the development of the heart-lung machine and the cardiopulmonary bypass in 1950s, which paved the way for the replacement of the mitral valve with an artificial valve. We find that the first mitral valve replacement, uh, the credit for it goes to Dr. Nina Star Brownwald. She, she designed a mitral heart valve with a prosthetic uh, flexible polyurethane with Teflon cordae tendine. And they did a lot of dog experiments at the Clinic of Surgery at National Heart Institute. And on March 11, 1960, they implanted this in a 44-year-old lady. And she did well. But she died four months later, uh, presumably due to an arrhythmia. So first successful prosthetic mitral valve replacement is credited to Nina Brownwald. And a year later, Albert Starr and Lowell Edwards they published the results for what was to become the first commercially available prosthesis, the Star Edwards and Caged Ball Mitral. Now, a uh, little bit about um, Lowell Edwards. He was a retired engineer whose specialty was hydraulics and pumps. 
But having suffered from rheumatic fever in his childhood, he was very much interested in creating uh, an artificial heart. That was his dream. So he presented his approach to uh, Star Edwards, and uh, I mean to Star, Albert Star, uh, and uh, their collaboration led to the design of the Star Edwards valve in the 1960, which was the first caged ball valve system to be ever approved by the FDA in the 1965. This is the Star Edwards ball and cage valve. Then coming to uh, this, this was the gold standard, like, you know, uh, till the various other designs of the mechanical valves started coming into the picture. This is the valve which is implanted from the LA side and view from the LV side. Various more designs started coming of the uh, ball and cage mitral valve. You had a smell of cutler. Uh, cutter valve, you had a brown wall cutter valve, but they all went into disrepute because they could not last the thrombosis part of it and all that. Then started coming the single leaflet valves, which are, which were called as a non-tilting disc valves of the be all. You had a non-tilting disc valve of Star Edwards also. You had the tilting disc valves, the famous Bjork Shiley valve, which carbon copy is the TTK Chitra heart valve indigenously made by our Professor Valyathan. Uh, it had to be taken off because of the strut fracture. You have the Metronic Hall from 1977, which um, is still with us. Of course, more tissue valves are coming into use now. So we have this various valves, single leaflet, bi-leaflets. And among the bi-leaflets, you have the St. Jude, Onyx, and the ATS, which are ruling now. Of course, not to be left behind was the design of, people thought even about the tri-leaflet valves, but they could not meet with a lot of success. So thus we see that mechanical valves evolved from Star Edwards to a single leaflet by Biol to tilting disc by Biox Shiley, Omnicarbon, Monostrat, Hallmetronic, bileaflet valves such as Carbomedics, ATS, Onyx, St. Jude, and even trileaflets. Thus, in the words of Dr. L. Henry Edmonds, he said that there was a great valve rush of the late 1950s and the early 1960s. And if you see this diagram, you will find that the mechanical valves they were ruling the forte till, say, year 1978. But slowly but surely, alongside, there was a development of um, bioprosthetic valves, tissue-based valves, as they realized that the blood thinners were lifelong, the patient who had to be on blood thinners, that was not appreciated by the patients. You will find in red that slowly the tissue valves started catching over uh, the pace. <laughs> These are the few bioprosthetic valves which started uh, getting evolved. I mean, as we all know, the bioprosthetic valves, the most two common are homografts and the xenografts. And in the xenografts, we have from the pig tissue and from the cow tissue. And uh, to go to the history of it, if we see, in spite of all the various things, Robert Freiter in 1961 is credited to have started using the autogenous pericardium. He started creating valves and the parts of the valves, he would suture freehand in 1961. Then there was, the, uh, for a temporary while, there was a success with pericardial xenografts, the Ionesque Shiley valve. Like within two years in the Denton, Cooley's, Texas Heart Institute, they ended up implanting 10,000 valves. Then we had, uh, but they went into, again, uh, they were taken, uh, they were recalled because there was a design failure, you know. So they never came back after that. Then in the 1976, we had the Hancock porcine valve. I'm just covering in a, a brief, uh, I mean, going fast over it, because uh, the three main valves which were to stay for the mitral position, all these valves were more for the aortic. So then in 1980, it was the Carpentier Edwards stented pericardial and porcine valves, which were created and they were to stay. Then we had the St. Jude, Perimount Magna, and Hancock valves. The people also thought of uh, what is called unstented mitral heterograft or allograft, but they had the theoretical attraction of like mimicking the natural mitral valve, but at present uh, they are not widely recommended. Now the history of mitral valve surgery thus progressed rapidly with a variety of uh, prosthetic and bioprosthetic valves. Ultimately, again it went to uh, era of successful valve repair operations with prosthetic ring annuloplasty, the credit for which goes to none other than Dr. Anne Carpenter, the French cardiac surgeon, who has been a pioneer for this. 
So I would just like to conclude with a discussion of the, after this, the current status of minimally invasive mitral valve surgery, both by direct vision and robotic assistance, because this is going to be covered in depth uh, in our subsequent uh, talks. Last but not the least, the talk will be incomplete without the mention of various percutaneous procedures uh, for mitral valve repairs and percutaneous trans uh, catheter mitral valve replacements, which apparently are questioning the role a cardiac surgeon is going to play in future as regards valvular heart disease. So we'll just go in brief with this. These are the few annuloplasty rings which were designed by Carpenter and the physio, geophysio ring and then evolved the era of minimally invasive approaches because in 1990s, the laparoscopic surgery uh, a, by general surgeons it renewed the interest in the cardiac surgeons too. We were the last to adopt this technique. And uh, credit again goes to Navia. Navia and uh, Navia is this, and uh, Cosgrove uh, um, is on the top. Uh, and the con and all, they performed the first minimally invasive operations via right parasternal and transternal approaches. Again, it is said that excellent exposure has been achieved through smaller incisions and thus making the complex valve operations possible and safe. So we have the category of surgeons who are for it and category who is not for it, and each tries to woo the other. So we have here a minimally invasive cardiac surgery. We can see on the left-hand side a full sternotomy how the heart is fully under your view and more safe and more controlled as against a small incision. But yes, you are still on bypass, so you can afford to have this you can see the incision which makes the difference to a patient of course the very smaller incisions which are very attractive and that is what the patient starts demanding slowly and you have now the first video assisted mitral valve repair by Carpenter and Edward then you have video assisted and robotics by Chitwood and all in the same year 1996 not to be left behind was the Leipzig group from Germany who started three-dimensional videoscopic robotic uh, voice activated uh, solo surgery they performed and then came in 1998 the first robotic completely robotic mitral valve replacement by uh, Carpenter et al using the Da Vinci surgical system we would like to see this uh, neocord thing it's very interesting how in a trans apically the mitral regurgitation is controlled by creating a new cord by inserting this device, the capture of the leaflet is confirmed outside by, uh, by turning the red signal to white. And then how the knot is created is very interesting. I would like to, to see that. The loop is pulled down within the same instrument out into the and then this instrument is going to be withdrawn. This is the technology which is evolving and making us rethink whether surgery is going to be the final answer. You soon find here the free end of the thread going into the loop and forming a knot which is pulled up. And then this knot is tied outside the heart. We find the echo confirmation that before the neocord, there is MR, and then you find that uh, after that, the MR has reduced. This is again the few percutaneous techniques which, has, which have evolved in the past two decades where uh, uh, the technology, as we said, has started rewriting the history in a different way. So you find the mitral clip system, which is used by, I think I'm going to skip this video because this is going to be covered in depth. Then we have uh, what is not achieved by all these percutaneous approaches is that we can end up putting a mitral clip, we can end up uh, putting a neocord, but then the claim that a complete repair is not, uh, a, a, a repair is not complete without an annuloplasty. So now they have started devising percutaneous techniques of putting coronary sinus annuloplasty devices and uh, 
uh, this is more again in trial in Europe. And uh, this is one of the, uh, this is uh, Carillon uh, mitral contour uh, uh, annuloplasty device. This is uh, in B, you see the Monarch device. Again, we are going to skip this video. This is the implantation through the internal jugular vein and uh, coronary sinus. It goes up to the great cardiac vein. These are various. Then coming to the percutaneous, not to be left behind was, OK, if you can do a repair, then why not the replacement? So then arrives the percutaneous scans catheter mitral valve replacement. And on April 13th, 2015, the U.S. for the first time uh, claims in its headlines in the papers that the, for the first time a patient walks away home uh, with his mitral valve replaced on the tip of a catheter with no scar and on a, without stopping his heart. So this is how various uh, companies, uh, especially the cardiac valve technologies, have evolved various uh, devices. You have here uh, Edwards Life Sciences mitral valves. I'm sure they are going to cover in detail. So I'm skipping all this. This is the processes being used for mitral valve. And this is how the claim is of about one patient on him they replaced. And the best part they try to tell you is that you can replace valve for the first time, second time, third time. In uh, like uh, the Bonhoeffer has replaced in a Fontan circuit he has replaced the valve now for the third time. So there is no limit to this. But again, not forgetting that we have to think also about the prevention or the regenerative medicine is also catching up, where they have designed the first mitral valve, the first prototype. They have utilized uh, an artificial valve for the dynamic modeling, as you see, made out of polyurethane in the right-hand side. So these are all various other things which are coming up. And uh, so finally, the question is arising in everyone's mind. This is where the famous, again, cardiac surgeon from London put this question to everybody. And this is the debate which is going on of late. But, and, and they say, it's very easy. You want a new device, all it takes is a drawing on a cocktail napkin, a patent, and an animation. So is it as simple as that? No. When the initial, it is only when the initial human experience begins that the real limitations of new approaches become apparent. It is unavoidable that unanticipated challenges will arise in the first patients treated with a new device. It's only at this stage that problems can be solved. It's the solution of these problems that ultimately leads to, of course, successful therapies too. And mitral valve treatment has evolved over the years. Current trends are the current trend you go to see in the history of mitral valve surgery is that more and more people are going for repairs, more for bioprosthetic valves, less invasive procedures, want to avoid cardiopulmonary bypass, want to have smaller incisions. But the question I'm leaving the audience with is, what all can you get away with? And less, yes, last but not the least, you can always think of the repair with regenerated tissue. Thank you, everybody, for patient listening.